Southland has a very diverse coastline, from the fjords in the west, to the coastal beaches of the south coast, to Stewart Island and the islands in Fovo Strait. Southlanders and tourists work and play along these coastal areas and enjoy the fishing, diving, boating, travelling and holidaying at favourite spots near the sea. Most Southlanders can be at the coast from their homes in an hour, and all within two hours. That makes the sea easily accessible to us all. While we enjoy its pleasures, there are also the hazards that it brings. It may be the brunt of a sou'westerly weather system, or a rogue wave that can upturn a boat. One of the least anticipated threats in Southland is the threat of tsunami. And while it's not an everyday occurrence, it is something that we need to be aware of. We may never see one in our lifetimes, and a number of generations may pass without seeing one. But we need to be aware, because one could happen any day, and we need to be prepared. The only history of major tsunami in Southland is from the early 1800s, when Naitahu speak of a large wave that killed many people at Oropuki and Waipapa Point. This would suggest a Pusica Trench tsunami. The last known death in New Zealand from tsunami was in 1868. It is important to remember that man's presence in New Zealand is relatively recent at around a thousand years. The Earth's forces which create tsunami have been twisting and moulding the Earth for millions of years. This means that information about major earthquakes and tsunami rely heavily on science rather than human experience. We will explain Southland tsunami hazard and some of the possible consequences so that you may be better prepared. Here is some information about tsunami from scientist Graham Leonard. Graham is a senior scientist within the Risk and Society Department of g and Science. New Zealand is uh, one of the most at-risk countries in the world for a tsunami. In any, in any one century there's probably a chance of uh, several large destructive tsunamis to hit New Zealand. The vul vulnerability varies uh, around the coast, so some areas are closer to a big earthquake source that can uh, provide a, a really big tsunami to the local coastline or a, an area of steep offshore shelf where uh, a landslide might locally produce a big tsunami. And then there's also variations in exposure to, to distance or tsunami. So tsunami that might be coming from South America or the northern part of the Pacific or even um, the Tongan uh, Samoan area uh, will generally affect certain parts of the country more than others. So the, especially the, the east coast and the northeast coast is more exposed to those Pacific, uh, Pacific wide tsunami. Locally generated tsunami are, uh, are especially likely around uh, the major fault lines in New Zealand and areas where we might expect big uh, landslides into the water or under the water. So we have a major fault line off of the east of the North Island. It's the, the boundary between the, the um, Pacific and the Australian plates and that can generate you know, very big tsunami along the east coast of the North Island. We also have a similar subduction zone um, trench off the southwest end of the South Island. There isn't as much of New Zealand exposed to those tsunami, but we could still get tsunami from that. And also the Alpine Fault, the fault that runs through the South Island that generates the Southern Alps, uh, could uh, cause uh, displacement near, near the coast on the west coast of the South Island, creating quite locally large tsunami. And there are also places around the coast that we know there are big potential landslide hazards. And a, a classic example is off the Kaikoura coast. We uh, get tsunami from a range of different places. Tsunami arrive uh, from across the Pacific right through to, to faults and landslides just offshore. And we tend to separate tsunami into distant source, regional source and local source. Tsunami are never just one surge of water. So tsunami come as a series of waves and uh, there are two important points. Um, the, the first wave may not be the largest and tsunami waves may continue to arrive for many hours. If it's a really big tsunami, uh, it, it may be causing disturbance in harbors and in the ocean for up to a day or longer. And what's interesting about tsunami waves is they have a really long length between waves. So um, if, 
uh, if the positive wave arrives first, the bulge of water arrives first, it will, um, it will rise rapidly and keep coming and coming for, for tens of minutes potentially. Um, and then it'll take the same amount of time to suck back out and then it will come back in again. Uh, the, the other point about tsunami uh, waves is that half of the time uh, you're going to get a positive wave, so you're going to get the bulge of water arriving at the coast first, and half of the time you're going to get a negative wave arriving first, so the water will withdraw. Uh, so there's only a 50% chance of seeing that water withdrawal ahead of the wave, and uh, in the other cases uh, it's the disturbance and noise from the ocean that's the only warning because you're not seeing a withdrawal of water. In a tsunami, uh, it's always best to try and get away from the water rather than trying to hold on to something. Tsunami waves are full of sand and rocks and buildings and sheet metal and cars and trees, and so they're very dangerous. People who are in the water, even if they're holding onto a tree or holding onto a building, uh, are very badly injured commonly by a tsunami wave. So it's always better to head for higher ground. In in a case where the, the tsunami is extremely close by and there's, there's no high ground nearby and there's a, a good solid high-rise building nearby, it might be worth heading up to the top of that building, but it would need to be several stories high. Even if you're at the coast uh, in an area that is, is dead flat, it's still worth running inland. Uh, every metre a tsunami uh, travels inland, even across dead flat ground, it will drop in elevation or every, every few hundred metres. So every metre inland that you, you manage to run, uh, you're going to be safer from that tsunami. As Graham told us, there are three types of tsunami. Local source, which are generated within one hour travel time from our coast. Regional source tsunami, generated one to three hours from our coast. And distant tsunami, which are generated more than three hours from our coast. Regional source tsunamis may come from the subantarctic faults. Fortunately, tsunami generating earthquakes in this area are rare. The other likely regional source is from faults on the east coast of the North Island around the Hikarangi Trough and the Kermadec Trench. Distant source tsunamis can come from anywhere around the Pacific Ring. Generally when they reach the southland coastline, their effect is barely noticeable. There is one exception however, and that is from South America. The South American fault, which is very active, is known to create large tsunami, most recently in 2010 following a magnitude 8.8 .8 earthquake. In Chile, waves of up to 2.6 metres high struck the coast, devastating many villages. In Southland at Dog Island, the maximum recorded wave was just over half a metre, and at the wharf at Stead Street it was recorded as 100 millimetres. It takes between 12 to 14 hours for the first waves to reach our coastline, enough time to get an official tsunami warning out. However, let's talk about local tsunami, or those that take less than one hour to reach the coast. For most of coastal Southland, the greatest threat is from the Pusica subduction zone. This is a fault line that extends from about 70 kilometres off the west coast of Fiordland and down towards the Auckland Islands. Subduction zones are found where two of the Earth's plates collide. In the Pusica Trench, the Australian plate is diving under the Pacific plate, forcing the Pacific plate up. This uplift has created the mountains of Fiordland and the Southern Alps. Further north, where the fault comes ashore, near the entrance to Milford Sound, we have the beginning of New Zealand's biggest earthquake fault, the Alpine Fault. While an alpine fault earthquake is also capable of causing tsunami, these are generally confined to the west coast. In June 2011, GNS Science released two reports into the effects of tsunami along the southland coast, but more specifically Riverton, the Invercargill estuary and the Bluff Ty areas. The information we are presenting here is sourced from these reports and the 2013 GNS Science Review of Tsunami Hazard in New Zealand. The 2011 report was written prior to the Japanese tsunami of 2011. Since that event, scientists have been reluctant to put an upper limit on earthquake magnitude in zones similar to the Pusica Trench. This makes it very difficult to assess maximum possible damage from a tsunami in Southland. We can only give an estimation based on probable scenarios. The impact of a tsunami is dependent on many things, including the magnitude of the earthquake, the area of the fault line that causes the quake, whether the fault moves horizontally or vertically, and the tide at the time the surges reach the coastline. The coastline from Pusica Point 
to Riverton and the west coast of Stewart Island are some of the most vulnerable to a Pusica tsunami. Modelling has revealed that tsunami surges of between 4 to 9 metres could be expected. The South Fiordland coast and Tawawa Bay are the closest to this threat and the beaches here will be the first landfall for the tsunami surge due to the proximity to the source. The waves will also be some of the biggest and could be over 10 metres high. The first waves will hit the South Fiordland coast around 10 to 20 minutes after the quake and be at the beaches around Blueclis and the Waiau mouth about 30 to 40 minutes after the quake was first felt. Many generations of Southlanders have enjoyed holidaying at Riverton and have seen in the new year at the Riverton Sound Shell. Taramia Bay is very open and exposed to the sea and therefore vulnerable to tsunami. The tsunami elevation here could be up to 6.5 metres. Information we have for Riverton Township could mean water reaching a height of 5 metres above mean sea level. If the tsunami waves were to be on top of a high or spring tide, the effect could be even greater. Most of Taramia Bay below Walker Street is less than 5 metres above mean sea level. Most of the business district is between 2 and 5 metres above sea level, which could mean that the town on the north side of the estuary could go underwater. The speed of the water is another factor. It could be up to 8 metres a second, or in other words, 29 kilometres an hour which would mean to outrun the wave you'd have to do 100 metres in at least 12 seconds. The best warning the residents of Riverton will get will be the actual earthquake that creates the tsunami. It will be felt as an earthquake that makes it difficult to stand, or a slow rolling quake that lasts up to a minute or more. This is the cue to think about possible tsunami and head inland or get to a high point as soon as possible. As the height of the tsunami will be unknown and you won't know when or how high the tide is going to be, Make a decision to get as far from the water as you can. Stay there until you receive information from authorities that the tsunami has subsided. Remember that a tsunami is not just one wave, but often a series of waves. So in Riverton, you should aim to get at least 20 metres above sea level, or one kilometre inland, to give a margin of safety. So why 20 metres? You need to make sure that you're at the height that gives you some sort of safety margin. Invercargill is also susceptible to tsunami, the areas along the length of Ariti Beach, parts of Otatara around Daffodil Bay and Sandy Point, the low-lying areas along the lower Ariti River, Clifton and Awarua are also at risk. There is also the threat of overtopping of the flood protection along the lower Waihopo Stream, in the vicinity of the Stead Street Bridge, along Bond Street through to the Waihopo Bridge on North Road. The airport is very low-lying and vulnerable to overtopping of the Stead Street flood protection. Along Areti Beach, we could see waves varying from 3 to 6 metres. The residents of Otatara have always had the threat of tsunami in the back of their minds. The GNS Tsunami Modelling Report 2011 tells us that coastal sand dunes in the forest offer protection in low-lying areas. The areas along Areti Beach through Sandy Point are dispersed with sand dunes and trees. These help to break up the surges of water and take the force out of the waves, thereby minimising the threat. During a tsunami alert, Stead Street is almost certain to be cordoned off, as it is at threat of being covered by water. Further research is required to find the exact risk for all the vulnerable sites around Invercargill. Residents would need to consider using Otatara Road, Bay Road route to go inland. We are working with GNE Science with updated ground level information to quantify this. On a good day, we see strong tidal inflow into Bluff Harbour. Yet in a tsunami, we can see inflow speeds of up to 28 kilometres an hour and inundation of up to 8 metres above sea level. Island Harbour would be at threat of total inundation, along with some of the lower lying areas close to the harbour. Emergency services would look at evacuating all areas up to 10 metres above mean sea level, which is generally above Barrow Street. The first wave could arrive about 80 minutes after the quake, it is important to note that the first waves will not be the biggest. Modelling suggests that the fourth wave will probably be the highest. The port has a lot of infrastructure that could be inundated, including the bulk fuel storage, log and chip storage, and cargo handling and storage areas. This raises the issue of a hazardous substance incident and the possibility of major delays for port, access and traffic. TY Point Aluminium Smelter has completed its own tsunami hazard analysis and has procedures in place. While they are very near the coast, the threat of flooding from tsunami is lessened by the sand dunes and forest. Waikawa is a significant location due to the harbour and visitors to the Curio Bay campground and petrified forest. It will take about two hours for the first waves to reach the shoreline after a Pusica quake. 
While it gives us more time to get a warning out, radio broadcast conditions in some of the beaches and bays around the coast is poor, so people will need to act on the natural warning and understand that a major quake that makes it difficult to stand will last longer than a minute, then they need to consider a tsunami and take some action themselves by getting to a high point or moving at least a kilometre inland. They are also more vulnerable to a distant earthquake from South America due to the exposure to the east, but there is a greater warning time. If you live near the coast in Southland, it is important to have a plan for you and your family. Making a plan does take some time and thought, and hopefully you will never have to use it, but it pays to be prepared. Think about what you will do, where you will go, and how you will get there. If you have neighbours that might need assistance, see if your plan can include assisting them. Remember for any emergency, have an emergency evacuation kit. Remember that if you have to leave in a hurry to take some form of ID, medication if you require it, and make sure you have a radio available to keep in touch with updates from emergency services. If you need to know more about any of the issues raised, take a look at our website. There you will also find our contact details, or phone us on 0800 76 45. You can also follow us on Twitter and Facebook.